Genesis chapter 3. So we finished our last Bible study at Genesis chapter 2. And then at Genesis chapter 3, we finally come down to the serpent introducing himself. The Bible says, now the serpent, so that's the devil, obviously. He's titled the serpent, was more subtle. So notice right here, it's S-U-B-T-I-L. The reason why is because this is old King James English, and, su and that's another way of S-U, uh, that's another word for uh, subtlety. That's another word for being subtle, how we would uh, word it today as S-U-B-T-L-E. So S-U-B-T-I-L is the old English way. So that's being subtle, deceptive, clever. So that's the idea. Notice it says, then any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So the Lord God, he made all sorts of animals, but there was one specific creature that the Lord made to be more subtle and that's the serpent. So out of all categories of the animal in the field. Now, investigating the serpent, there are a few, there are two possibilities with this serpent. One, the serpent, he could be an animal himself. Now, that might surprise you. You might say, I thought he was an animal, but there's another explanation for it. The first possibility is that he is an animal. And being an animal himself, the Lord mentioned that basically this category of creature compared to other creatures, he is more subtle, he is more smart. Now this could, uh, this could mean in a, not a really negative term, so it doesn't mean that when God created the snake, that obviously that it's a bad creature. So all of God's creatures, including the snakes today, and yeah, the cockroach in your kitchen, everything God had made, behold, it is very good. Now, can I get an amen from the ladies? No, you don't have to. Don't worry about that. So, everything the Lord God created and made is good. Now, we had this one idiot who just threw a flip and she threatened, she claimed to be from PETA. And then she tried to send an email to PETA and to everybody. And then uh, just tracing her email address and everything. You know, I, I questioned it and I responded back to Peter saying, you know, this person is very suspicious and et cetera. I'm not really sure. And the person acted all kind and nice after that. But anyways, um, the person, you know, took it the wrong way that I was saying cats are extremely evil creatures. So because of that, you have to avoid them and they're Satan's uh, minions and et cetera. But the thing is this, is that concerning about cats and then insects and snakes, for some of you who don't know, they are usually attributed to devils, for some of you who didn't know that. It does not mean that the animal himself is literally uh, of the devil. All of God's creatures are pure and good. But the idea is, is that they have a character within them, so it's not sin, all right, understand that. It's not sin, but usually Satan, he tries to see something in your character that he can use to his advantage and turn it into sin. So snakes being subtle, sly, slippery creatures, and that's the impression that they give, that's the kind of animal that attracts the devil. So that's why he would use that creature. So he would use that creature to accomplish his goal and his feat. So it could be that Satan transformed himself into a, a creature because he is part of the reptilian, aquatic reptilian class, for some of you who didn't know. So being the part of an aquatic reptilian class, it could be that Satan is coming down as some sort of aquatic reptilian. It doesn't have to be necessarily or completely a snake. It could be more of a snake category, basically a different type of species of snake. We're going to give, see an example at Revelation chapter 12. Now keep your hand here. Turn to your other hand to Revelation chapter 12. So the creature, the serpent, 
could be a different type of species, so to speak. And the species that he can give off is basically what the Bible calls the dragon, the dragon. And then he also, it also calls him the serpent at the same time. So it could be that, so we can see automatically from here that this is not your normal type of snake. It's a different, unique type of serpent. All right, so we're going to look at the book of Revelation chapter 12. Notice at verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now keep your hand at Revelation 12, because we're going to go back there. And I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, please. The book of Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah. And we're going to look at the chapter 27, 27, and verse 1. Chapter 27, and we'll look at verse 1. So notice here that the category of the serpent that he's in is a, not just an ordinary reptile, it's an aquatic reptile. So notice in Isaiah chapter 27, and then we're going to read verse 1 here. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish, notice, Leviathan. So that's a water creature. The piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So notice that this creature inhabits the waters. So this is an aquatic reptilian. So this is an aquatic reptilian creature. So Satan is a unique type of reptile class and category. However, there's something else about it. Go to Revelation 12 again, and then looking back at that main text, looking back at the main text there, you're going to notice something, that he is not literally the serpent. Now you might say, I thought we take the Bible literally. Yeah, if you take the Bible literally, then you're going to notice the wording there. So here's possibility number two. Possibility number two, it's a title. It's a title. He's not really the serpent, but rather his title. And if we take the word literally as it says at Revelation chapter 12, notice it's more of a title. The Bible says the same passage. It mentions the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. But look at this, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the wor whole world. So notice that the category is giving it as a name, a title. But you'll notice that he was cast out into the earth and his. So it's being personified here. It's being personified. Another instance we shall turn is going to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If we were to think about it, if Satan came down as this type of serpent, which is terrible in appearance and terrifying, then Eve would have freaked out her mind and ran away. So then, rather than coming down as a snake, he could come down as typically a beautiful angel. An angel, if you notice in the Bible, are 33 and a half year old men. Nothing where it would attract a woman as an ugly, slimy snake. No, a 33 and a half year old George Clooney, something like that. I don't know. All right, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You ladies just go wow and then get into that. But hey, you men too, all right? You men too. There's a reason why you men fell at the garden, all right? All right, 2 Corinthians, that's all I'll say before I get stoned to death. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll look at verse 14. When Satan appears to people, this is his transformation. Verse 14, and no marvel, don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So he transforms himself into an angel of light. Now, with this angel of light, there could be something here. Let's look at Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1. 
We're going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, there is a certain transformation and stage that the devil co comes down and appears as. For some of you who don't know, it is his cherub status. His cherub status, for some of you who know your Bible and who heard me teach for a long time, it is part of a specific class, reptilian aquatic. So, then in other, in other words, he may not be coming down as a serpent himself, but there could be something with the first possibility here. So the, remember, the first possibility is that he comes down as a unique type of serpent. The second possibility is that he's not. He's coming down as an angel of light. It's more of his title. But it could be with the second possibility where I'm saying his title that there is some type of serpent appearance perhaps because his angelic status consists of the aquatic reptilian class. So we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Now notice that there are cherubs mentioned here at verse 5, and out of the, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. So notice here that these are cherubs. These are angelic beings. It's more plain when we look at verse 10. As for the likeness, of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So notice here, memorize these uh, four categories, man, lion, ox, and eagle. Now, if we were to go to Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel chapter 10, notice the wording here. Remember the four categories. If we were to turn to Ezekiel chapter 10, I want you to look at verse 1. Then I looked and behold in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims. So notice that these living creatures at Ezekiel 1 are called cherubims. And also, uh, we're not going to expound it here, but a simple uh, reading of Ezekiel 10 and Ezekiel 1, all the descriptions will exactly match each other. So, we're gonna, so you will know these are the exact same for cherubims. But if you keep reading about these cherubims, notice that their appearance is likened in this manner at verse 14. And everyone had four faces. Remember, it's ma man, ox, eagle, and lion. The first face was the face of a cherub. Well, that's different. And the second face was the face of a man. And the third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the, fourth, the face of an eagle. Wait, wait a minute. There's a missing category here. Notice it's ox, but it's replaced with the word cherub. Why is that? Because Satan is the cherub. Look at Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. So Satan, for some of you who don't know, he is called this category. He is called serpent. He is called dragon in the sea. So basically a sea dragon. So he's aquatic reptilian. Then we see here in Ezekiel 28, he's called cherub. But this cherub is also called ox. So let's see how this all totals out. Okay, we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 28, and then we're going to read verse 14. Verse 14. The Bible says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Notice this is Satan at verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. So that's undoubtedly Satan. So notice that Satan, he is also called the cherub. Uh, if the tech man could probably uh, scoot a bit, that way I could see my... F okay, there we go. All right, I just wanted to make sure, that's all. That's okay. Yeah, it's, 
You guys don't have an easy job. Okay, so we'll notice here that Satan, he's called the cherub. We can all agree with that. The cherub is also called the ox. So he is part of the ox category. Now that's a question you say, but I thought you said he's an aquatic reptilian class. Why is he known as the ox? The reason why we're going to uh, return to Genesis, we're going to return to Genesis chapter 3. Notice the wording here, which is very interesting, which is very interesting. Before we read Genesis 3, though, let me explain something here. So we see that Satan, he is called serpent, dragon, the sea, cherub, ox. Now within these four cherubim status, let's put this here. Within these four cherubim status, notice that these four cherubims are basically, we can see it could be that it was after the fall of Adam, because the timeline is way after Genesis, but that's a different teaching, so whether or not that may be the case. The point is, within these four cherubims, it covers all classes of creatures, except one class of creature you'll notice, and those are aquatic animals and reptiles. So that's why Satan fills in that gap when we look at Isaiah 27, where he is aquatic reptilian. Because we see that there are four cherubims. There is one more cherubim that's uh, covering the missing class, and that is aquatic animals that are reptiles. But then the rest of the class of creatures, they can cover all types of four-legged uh, or flying creatures, etc. But, but there's a question here. If Satan's called cherub, and cherub can, is another name for ox, then could it be that aquatic reptilian class can match with the ox in some way? Yes, because if you look at Genesis chapter 3, you'll notice the wording of verse 1, then any beast of the field, right? But it becomes more specific than that. The more specific term is if you look at the latter verses of verse 4, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all what? cattle and above every beast of the field. Look at that. The serpent, God sees that. Notice that God completely ignores scientific, uh, the scientific terminologies and what people would deem to be science. The Lord don't care about that. He has his own category of how he deems his creatures. And how he deems the creature of the serpent is to be within the same cattle category. Which is why Satan, he is known to be a red figure with a serpentine tail and two horns like an ox. That's the reason why you get these cartoon depictions. They just don't come out of thin air. Mythology, cartoons, and etc., they get it from an original idea somewhere. And sometimes the, the original ideas get it from an actual historical person or event or source. It's just been carried on into the imagination a little bit more. But a lot of these imaginative stories that you hear about or see today, there is some truth somewhere. Let's return to Genesis chapter 3. So we now understand about Satan's category, what he is. The next part of verse 1 says, And he said unto the woman, Okay, what does he directly say to the woman? Yea, hath God said. So, yea... In other words, like indeed, like truly. Now notice that it starts out as something positive. Yes, God did say. It starts out positive. Now what's the point here? The point is Satan, he is a master of positivity. Wait, then are you saying that the power of positive thinking is a demonic trait? Absolutely for some of you who didn't know about that. So, wait a minute, then, if I hear a pastor who always talks about positive things, and he always smiles, then you're saying that's a demonic trait. Absolutely. Yeah. Then, should I be attending that church? No, that's full of Satan worship. You're attending a satanic service right now. 
Okay, so that's pretty strong, but it's the truth because notice that Satan, he's all about positivity. Being a master of positivity, he starts out with, not with no, but yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Yea, hath God said. It is truly a sign of a demonic trait. That's why Eve fell. Why did he fall into sin and then she messed up her life? Because she was deceived by something positive, told herself it would be positive when it would actually kill her. Usually, that's the reason why today's sermons are very harmful to people because they don't, a lot of them don't know that the Christian life is filled with suffering. They think it's a life of blessing and God will be good to you and that you just have to believe and have faith and then even just plant a little seed of money and that you will be incredibly rich. But a successful life is not dictated in, in such a manner. So that kind of positive message is something demonic. And then when people go bankrupt because they're supporting so many TV preachers and then people end up uh, living a lie that, hey, I'm going to live a good life. This suffering will go away. This suffering is not going to be a part of my life forever and et cetera, et cetera. What happens to these same people? They live up their lives blaming God because God, you're supposed to show me good things, but instead I get bad things. They become bitter, they damage their lives and their own families. Yep. Just like Eve, you just start out with something positive and you get deceived into that and then you damage yep. your whole life. Yep. Let's look at several examples here of uh, the dangers of positive thinking. The dangers of positive thinking. We're going to look at the book of Genesis, chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. Now notice that Rebecca, she had a positive, she had a positive thinking that, well, I know Esau is mad at Jacob and he wants to kill him, but it's not that bad as I think. And Jacob, you're going to go away from the family just for a few days. Well, guess what? It turned out to be more than 14 years. So it was like practically 20 or probably even more years that Jacob was away from the family. So the damage was really that big, but Rebecca didn't make it a big deal. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 27 and then verse 42. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Okay, that's bad. All right, what does she do? What does she do? Verse 44, she smiles, folds her hand, and then just like a Joel Osteen, she says, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn, uh, turn away. How about that? She positively thought that it was only going to be a few days. And by the way, guess what? When Jacob returned home, Rebekah was the one who died, but not Isaac. Isaac thought that he was going to die soon. This time at Genesis 27, he thought he was going to die soon. But the irony is that instead Rebekah died and Isaac lived longer. He lived uh, almost 20 years longer, if not more. How about that, huh? So the positive thinking can kill you. Here's another example. We're going to look at the book of Matthew. Notice that this person said a positive statement. Matthew chapter 26, 26. But then his positive thinking was what caused him pain at the end, unbearable pain. Jesus gave a negative message, a negative sermon, and the person rejected the negative sermon and said, no, the Lord's going to do good things with me. Typical Laodicean Christians today who go to a mega church or a Joel Osteen type of church. Now, we're going to look at verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So notice that this is a very negative message. Now, notice what Peter says, 
Verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, though all, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Then Jesus gave a, another negative message. He made it more specific. Well, I didn't want to point you out, Peter, but I try to make it general in my negative sermon. But if you insist not to repent and get right with God, I'm going to get more specific here. God forbid that's going to happen to this pastor, right? If you want to get the gist of the general negative sermon, my advice is get the gist. Don't make it go more specific, please. <laughs> Verse 34. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crowed, thou shalt deny me thrice. Now that's really bad. What did Peter do? Verse 35. Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Power of positive thinking. And guess what happened? He denied Jesus. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. You know what caused the downfall and pain of the universe? A satanic being who had a lot of positive thinking. This is proof that positive thinking is a demonic trait. It is a demonic trait. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So this is Satan himself. What did he say? Look at all the positive statements here at verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Wait, wasn't there a book written by a famous preacher that talked about the power of I in it? And then Oprah Winfrey said, this is such a great book. You know what that pastor has? He has a satanic title then. Now, don't look at me like a tree full of owls. Read your Bible, okay? Let, let's see how many eyes here, shall we? One. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Now, interestingly, that's five, and if you know your Bible, five is the number of death. What did God say at verse 15? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. You know what? The sign of a positive sermon is always I, 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 me, me. The sign of a negative sermon is you need to get right with God. You are the problem. You, 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 negative. Positive sermon, I, 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 connected to something positive. All right, let's go to Genesis 3, Genesis chapter 3. Amen. Yeah. Genesis chapter 3. Well, you don't have to say you all the time. Why do you always say you? You think you're better than us? No, it's the word of God that I'm preaching. Because the direct uh, implication from God is trying to reach you. <laughs> trying to reach you. Let me do this. <laughs> so it's trying to reach you that way. You can get under conviction and go, oh, he's talking to me. God is speaking to me. There's something wrong with me that I have to fix here. Let's look at... Now, before I preach my main sermon today, I hope that you always think about yourself, not the other person or people in general. You have to look at yourself. By doing that, then you can search which areas that the Lord is speaking to you because I'll be honest, I have no idea, and I haven't got a clue, and I don't want to even know. All I can do is just preach the word of God, and it's between you and God where, you're, you're, where God is speaking to you. You see where it's hitting you? Because I can't do that. Amen. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. So, keep reading at verse 1. Notice that there's so much to learn just from the first verse about Satan. So, yea, hath God said. So, yes, God did say. But notice, he turns it into a question. It's like, certainly, yes, at the beginning, but then it turns into the question. Ye shall not eat every tree of the garden? So, he's asking Eve a question that you can't eat every, you can't eat the fruit from every tree of the garden. Now notice the clever wording of this. The clever wording, one, you got to know that Satan is a very clever creature. That's definitely 
point number one there. So Satan, uh, the sign of his traits is positivity, and also he is very, very, like the Bible says at verse one, subtle. So he is intellectual. He uses intellectual means. Notice how persuasive the language is. The language is, are you really sure? So in other words, it's doubt. It's a question. So Satan's way of increasing intellectual means, which is what you learn in school nowadays, is to always question. So is that what the Bible really says? Oh, is it really true that homosexuality is what we call sin? Oh, uh, does God really exist? How do you know? See, it's question. Question, 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 question. God is, it is so. This is truth. That's God. Satan's mean is, is it truth? Is it really so? So notice that Satan is not interested in the truth, and that is the point of higher education, is that it claims that it seeks after truth, but it has no interest in truth. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, as they believe that in order to get closer to the truth, you cannot arrogantly claim that you have 100% truth. You have to keep questioning and questioning and questioning, and then you'll get closer to the truth. No, a lot of times that when you start questioning, you realize how much more abstract and further away you are from the truth, which is why they always say morals are relative and that truth is relative. That's how they end up in. So it's always the sign of relativity. A second thing, you'll notice how it's very intellectual, is that he says, did God say you can't eat every fruit in the garden? He could have worded it as, are you sure that God said you can't eat this particular tree? No, he switched the wording like, uh, are you sure God said you can't eat every tree of the garden? And then you're like thinking, well, God did say I can eat all trees here in the garden, excluding one. So you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to find a statement that affirms what God said but ignoring some of the parts where God warned them. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is God gave a statement to Adam and Eve. You can eat every, you can eat the fruit of every tree in the garden. So that's what Satan is affirming here. So because he's sharing the same wording that the Lord will use, it deceives a person into thinking, this is what God said. Satan is giving me the wording that God would say. But then he drops a certain part here. God says, don't eat the, this particular tree in the Garden of Eden, and that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan, what did he do? He ignored that part. You know what fake news is? Typical CNN, MSNBC, and yes, including Fox News and all the science universities, yes, they're guilty. I don't care who they are and if they're such good people to write limitations in their research journals and etc. They're all biased individuals, every one of them. And the evidence is the tons of scientific journals that try to condone and praise evolution when they don't even know what they're talking about here. So these people, see, they affirm statements that are true and real but then they miss other parts of the argument that are truth, but they just overlook that. Why? To deceive you. And then mainstream news and the universities deceive you. You bunch of deceived people. Fallen victim to that. Fallen victim to that. And I'm going to include the online world too, because there's so much wrong doctrine over there and they boast themselves as being truthers, but then in reality, they're not truthers because what? They mess up in so much doctrine. They think that as long as I'm against the globalist system, I must be in the right crowd. <laughs> Aren't you a funny guy? Aren't you a funny person? Uh, you got to realize a lot of the Jews, they didn't want to join the globalist system of the Roman government. But guess what? The devil deceived them. The Jewish zealots are a great example. And what happened to them? They became no more. Okay. So we have to understand the mindset of Satan. You have to 
You can't just look at some pieces of information that seem to affirm the Word of God and automatically assume, oh, this must be from the Word of God. No, you got to look at all places and see what's missing. Everyone looks at John MacArthur. Great guy, you know, he stood up against the government. He stood up for Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're only looking at some of the places where he stands and affirms the Word of God. But just like the serpent dropping the missing pieces, they don't look at his missing pieces. Where he, starts, where he makes people terrified of their salvation, make them doubt their salvation, like the serpent questioning. Why? Because he questions your works out of your life. And if you don't have the works of a Christian in your life, then you're not genuinely saved. Doesn't that contradict the word of God? It doesn't affirm. God says, grace, you're saved, not by works. Amen. Now, returning to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we understand that this is the mindset of Satan. That's how he works. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. So Satan will affirm the word of God. Did you hear what I just said? Satan will affirm the word of God to deceive you in order to give you some confirmation of the word of God while the remaining parts are a blatant lie. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Notice what Satan did. And Matthew chapter 4, verse 6, uh, verse 5. Then the devil taketh him, that's Jesus, up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Notice the wording of Satan. He starts out with something positive. Yes, indeed, truly. For it is written. This is what the Bible says. See, he starts out with an affirmation that jumps into a question. Do you read research articles? They start out with a conclusion and a statement. And then later on, they give out these questions to think about. Hey, hello. Hey. That's clever. That's very clever. Satan knows how, what's intellectual conversation give out a conclusion, an affirmation, but then delve into the questions that support his conclusion. You think Satan doesn't know the rules of logic and reasoning and debate and arguments? He's way better than me and you. He knows all the rules. He knows all the logical fallacies and all the logical consistencies, premises, conclusions. Watch out for that. Notice he starts out, for it is written, and then he, shall, he quotes the scripture. He affirms the word of God. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So notice he quotes scripture. Now, you know what you need to do? Your automatic response should not be, oh, because he affirmed the word of God, I'm going to listen. No, you study the scriptures yourself, and find out which parts is true and which parts is false. What did Jesus do at verse 7? Did, study the scriptures. That's what he did. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That should be the Bible-believing response. Yep. Onliners, we live in a day and age where you don't study the Bible. You just watch videos. You just get dazzled by Ravi Zacharias' statements where it lacks scripture. Mm -hmm. You know what's so funny? I warned you about that a long time ago and people got mad at me. And then John MacArthur actually confirmed my statement that we were friends. We were very close friends and I told him twice that he don't quote scripture. Oh, now you catch up? <laughs> and then you all blame me and get mad at me. So John MacArthur actually confessed that after the Ravi Zacharias scandal. I told you so. All right, Genesis chapter 3. Go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. You think that I'm just being a young, pompous, arrogant idiot. No, you just lack spiritual discernment. 
You're not looking at the spiritual life of individual and the spirit. You don't look at the spiritual workings behind it. And the only way you can tell the spiritual workings and the behind the life of a person is through the word of God. But well, you lack such knowledge of the scriptures. Now, going back here, we see verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, so now Eve responds to, to Satan. She responds to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So notice that she says here that we are allowed, so we may, eat of all the fruits that are in the trees of the garden. But, however, of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, she says the particular fruit that's in of the tree, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, obviously, that's in the middle, the center of the garden. God has said, so God said about this particular tree, ye shall not eat of it. So God said that you're not supposed to eat it, neither shall he touch it. So God supposedly said that you're not to even touch the fruit, lest he die. Notice the word lest. Or maybe you might perhaps die. Now, notice that her language does not match with God's statement. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. For some people who don't know about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was a cause to temptation and sin. Now, I want you to basically mark these down and write them in your notes. That way, it will help you when you fight against temptation in your own life, okay? So, notice the first category. The first category is where Satan comes in. So, temptation, the tempter comes in. So, that's the first category. And when he comes in, he comes in something that attracts you. That's what we learned so far, right? He doesn't come in in the means that terrifies you. He comes in in a way that dazzles the ladies, so to speak. The second thing that he will do is that he starts out with something positive. Why? To appeal your flesh. You know why you yield into temptation and sin to begin with? It's positive to you. It's beneficial to you. I mean, you think that when God tells you, get up out of bed and go to street preaching, that your automatic response is listening? No. But if the devil starts out your day as, you know, uh, get up out of bed and let's just uh, do whatever you want, then that motivates you more, right? See, how Satan starts out with temptation and sin is something that benefits you. But when God says something or something that's scriptural says something that you feel like doesn't benefit you, you better take that as a sign from God and wake up. Usually people respond with anger, negativism, or uh, antagonism, with something negative from the word of God. See, that's Satan's tactic is to use positive means. That's how you yield into temptation and sin. The other reason, the next step on how you yield to temptation and sin is that notice that Satan will affirm the word of God, right? So then he'll say that, so that's what you do with temptation and sin is, well, you know, God won't really make a big deal out of that. I mean, it is spiritual that I, I mean, there's a good spiritual reason why I can't come to church today. There's a good spiritual reason why I can't do this duty for the Lord. You see that? And then notice that the next step is this affirmation will turn into a question. The affirmation turns into the question. So then once you affirm the word of God through demonic means, then you're going to be questioning, I wonder really then, I wonder really if it's a sin that I actually do this. I wonder if it's really worldly that I do this. Right? I hope people are getting under conviction here because this is going to change your life. And I strongly believe the reason why many people remain stubborn and the way they are and they don't repent and change is they don't look, they don't observe these following steps. My advice is this. Before you think and before you say something and do something, rewind your life and see if all these steps just went like that in a blink of an eye and you didn't catch it. That's how Satan does things. 
You tend to just go by impulse, how the flesh goes or how by the world operates. And then you just say and do and think stuff the way, depending on how the environment goes, the world, and how you feel, the flesh. And you, your third enemy, the devil, is doing all these steps within one second like that in a blink of an eye. And you need to stop before you say and do something. You need to stop. Just shut up and stop before you give some kind of emotional response of anger or crying or sensitivity. You better stop and shut up and rewind your life and see if these steps you fell into. All right. I'm, I'm preaching really hard here. And the reason why is, is because there's something stubborn within human nature. It's very stubborn, and it's very ignorant, and we don't catch it, and this might help you. It will save your life, because I told you before, positivity leads you to death. You don't want to kill your life. You're already killing yourself right now, dragging yourself into church, aren't you? Some of you are just killing yourselves. You don't have a happy home. You don't have a happy life. You're, uh, you don't have a, a happy spiritual walk. Why? Because something positive has been killing you. And you let it kill you. Amen. Now, notice that the next step. So then you start questioning yourself. And this is all intellectual, of course. You might want to write that as a side note. A decision that you make is not really a dumb decision. The decisions you make, there's good reasons for it. Legit reasons for it. And it's even a smart move. All right. It's an atmosphere of uh, higher education, intellectualism. It's okay. It's a smart move. Now, notice how it contradicts the Word of God. The next thing, then, is where you started to affirm the Word of God, then you start to question what you're doing, and what that's going to lead to is questioning the Word of God itself, and that's the next step. You critique the Word of God. So then you're going to critique saying, well, I know that I heard the preaching that day or the Bible study that day, and I know that what I study in the Bible before said that, but, 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 you got to check your heart and see, is this because of fleshly means here? All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 2. And then uh, we're going to read verse, let's see here. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So notice in the passage here that God says, Thou mayest freely eat, right? That's the wording there. So the next part says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, concerning this tree, thou shalt not eat of it. So notice that God says, You can't eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, because in the particular day that you eat it, notice it says, thou shalt surely die. So notice here that God says, surely, right? He didn't say maybe or perhaps. He says, guaranteed you will die. Guaranteed you will die. But Eve said, lest ye die. Christians back off in their, uh, uh, Christians nowadays, they back up, back off in their statements of yay, yay, and nay, nay with, Maybe this and maybe that. Why? Because it's a sign of intellectual means that went from a question, and this question is derived when you keep going backwards to something that is something positive and beneficial to you, which is why you have to check your heart. Notice the other difference here. Notice that Eve, she changed the word of God because she said, lest he die. But God says, surely you're going to die. The second thing that Eve did is that she added to the word of God. Notice she said, neither shall he touch it. God never said that. So notice that in the word of God, when God speaks truth here, notice that the word of God, it is one changed by Eve. Two, it is added. And then three, it is subtracted. Right. Yeah. 
So she added, neither shall he touch it, and then she goes, lest he die. But notice what she subtracted at verse 16, Genesis 2, 16. God said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest, what? Freely eat. He didn't just say, you may eat, you're allowed to eat every tree of the garden. He says, you can eat it freely. That's very important. So why? Because God's gift is basically offered as something that's free. So God gave it offer as a free gift. Now, because this tree, especially the tree of life, the tree of life is something they can partake in freely. Eve's sin of subtracting that word affected basically for eternity. Go to Revelation 22. Now, this is not a coincidence how God worded this at Revelation 22. It's as if God knew that Eve messed up on something. Look at Revelation 22. If you are in our Revelation verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, you might recall this. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 22. And then we're going to read verse 17. Notice that God, when he invites them to the tree of life and the water of life, one item is you may partake in it freely, but the other item, he says, no, you're going to work for it. Why? Because something happened here. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hear say, come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life, what? Freely. God says, partake in it freely. But look what he did with the tree of life at verse 14. 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. See, that works. That they may have right, so that you can have the right, the access to the tree of life. That's very different from back then. See, Eve's sin caused something throughout eternity. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2. So that's why if you look at your Bibles today, do you see words that are missing in your Bibles? I guarantee you this, if everyone does not have a King James Bible, and then there are like a hundred different Bible versions that we were all reading, you're going to find words that are missing. Yeah. Yep. Words that are added yep. and words that are changed. Yes. And then you don't think that having 200 plus modern Bible versions, it's not a big deal. Are you kidding me? And you think that King James onlyism is a cult mindset. Are you kidding me? That's a cult mindset when you have this kind of mentality for the word of God, I'll tell you that much. That's a cult mentality. That's a dangerous mentality. That's a satanic mentality. So that's something that happened. Why? Because of Satan. So it makes you wonder with all these Bible scholars, what's their aim and goal and intention with modern Bible versions? You know, the number one proponent for modern Bible versions and the only reason why he became famous is not because he's a smart Calvinist. It's because of his stance that's anti-King James. All the other people, they didn't publish a, a work like he did. So James White, the only reason why he became famous is because of his anti-KJV stance. If it weren't for that, he'd probably be a nobody by now. So with his book, The King James Only Controversy, he actually admitted from one of his videos that the reason why these modern Bible version companies, they, make, they keep updating translations and they publish all these Bibles is because they need money. He admitted that. The number one anti-KJV advocate. How about that? He admitted that. He confessed that. So look at all these Bible translation scholars. It starts out with something positive that benefits them. Money, money, money. And then you just look at the steps. They affirm the word of God. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, we want to help out the Bible here. We want to spread the word of God, his kingdom. And then it gets them to question. So then I wonder if this King James Bible is good enough. There could be errors. There are wordings that are pretty old and should be modernized for updated English and etc. And then what does it lead down to? Right here. And you want to, you know... I dare say this, I could be wrong, but 
of us Christians, including myself, perhaps committed this sin before in our lives. You might say, why is that? Because when you're going through temptation and sin, once you reach this step when you're questioning God, then you start to change, add, and subtract what God told you to do. And then a lot of Bible-believing Christians are guilty. And, you know, that's why there's a lot of church splits and then a lot of preachers who have high and mighty doctrinal attitudes. Bible-believing communities, it's really bad. Why? The reason why is because they think they know the Word of God. And because they think they know so much doctrine in the Word of God, they change, add, and subtract to the Word of God. And I'd be careful if I were you. Some of you better be scared, on your knees trembling. You see, that's the reason why I, I give a lot of wacky, crazy stuff, right, online? I do that. But I don't do it in a way where it causes division in the Bible-believing body of Christ. If it causes divisions for those who are wrong doctrines or apostate Christian churches, I could care less. And people can accuse me of being divisive. But amongst the Bible-believing churches and community, I try to remain united with them. You might say, why is that? Because the reason why is if I don't remain united with them, there might be a reason what causes the division and separation. It could be that arrogance that, oh, I know the word of God so much and let me tell you what I think is the word of God. So you have to be careful of that attitude. Even some doctrines, you notice that I'll say it's a theory, right? Or possibly. There's a lot of times that I would do that. Why? Because I don't want to tell you what God says if that's not what he said. A lot of people think that, oh, I can just, uh, if I'm wrong, then I'll just change my teaching later on in life. So, look, uh, there should be an attitude of humility, and if you're wrong, then you should change. That's a good thing. But look, if you keep changing all the time, then there's a problem right here because you're teaching the word of God. And that means that you've changed that and subtracted too many times. Wow. Yeah. All right, going back. Oh, we got to stop here. Okay, so I've spent too much time on just the Remember. first three verses of Genesis. All right, all right, you learned something. We're going to come now to the next steps, all right? We're, uh, there's going to be a lot of good stuff that you're going to learn as we com continue the temptation and sin. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and that we take the scriptures seriously and that we will not fall into temptation and sin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.